And welcome back everybody to our afternoon session uh, of our Social Bridges workshop. And it's my pleasure to introduce Psyche, Psyche Louie. I think there's no big introduction needed because everybody knows her. She is Associate Professor of Creativity and Creative Practice at Northeastern University in Boston and the Director of the Mind Lab. And I still find this, this acronym like so clever, like music, imaging and neural dynamics. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's really great uh, to have you here, Psyche. And uh, you talk about prediction and reward in music across the lifespan. And the stage is yours, please go ahead. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you, Merle. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Um, I'm really excited to show you some of what we've been working on, all very new stuff, uh, mostly not yet published or in various stages of review. And I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing what you, you all think. Um, so let's get started with something that's not so controversial. Uh, music is found in all human societies, um, in many different social contexts. Uh, we celebrate the making of music. We celebrate the making of music together um, for, um, for sexual selection reasons, for um, group social bonding reasons, for infant soothing reasons. Um, we don't really need to be taught to, um, to enjoy music, right? So people don't actually have to uh, be explicitly instructed to go to a big old concert to rock out together. Um, so there's something about music that seems to be implicitly uh, acquired and implicitly enjoyed. Um, now, of course, all that um, rocking out together um, got canceled um, around March 2020 um, when the coronavirus happened. Um, but then instead of that, we rapidly started to see um, exactly what Niels talked about in the last talk, um, this um, kind of a smorgasbord or, 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 or a, a renaissance of, uh, of musical artists seeking out musical experiences by themselves. Now, if you look at each of these performers, these are folks that normally would get paid, I don't know, millions of dollars um, to play a show. And now these folks are playing without being paid, right? So there's something about um, the music seeking that's, that's, um, that's an intrinsic reward. And so we want to know why that is um, and how the brain um, comes to, to, to seek out music. Um, so in 2000, uh, 2021, um, Pat Savage and, uh, and Bronwyn Tarr and uh, Stakamsey Fitch and a few other co-authors and myself, we, uh, we came up with this overarching model of musicality as a co-evolved system for social bonding, something that um, Niels also mentioned in the last talk. Um, and so we talk about the different kinds of musical features um, that might be useful for tuning um, the neural systems that are important for um, for reward, and that reward um, tends to uh, is what becomes shared with what's needed for social bonding. And so today, I want to focus on um, on the proximal parts of that overarching model. I want to focus on how it is that musical features and the mechanisms underlying those musical features uh, might feed into the neurobiological underpinnings um, that enable um, the way the uh, musical predictions become turned into reward. And that, that might um, enable kind of be, be, be the neurobiological basis for how um, uh, uh, social bonding um, co-evolved with musicality. Now, so now when we're talking about the reward system, um, we know that uh, the environmental cues uh, predict biologically salient stimuli that become rewarding, right? So there's uh, so the game is about dopamine neurons, um, and you know if you uh, and it's been found since the 90s that if you record from a monkey the dopaminergic system of monkey uh, while it's getting juice, um, so uh, if and then if you play a tone or a conditioned stimulus um, before the juice reward, uh, then the dopaminergic neurons rapidly. Uh, become responsive to the tone, right? It become responsive to the condition stimulus rather than to the reward itself. Um, so the dopaminergic system is very good at learning um, to predict environmental stimuli that are rewarding. Um, and of course, we know that there's a set of brain regions, including uh, the nucleus accumbens and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex that are key to that reward system in humans. Um, now, of course, when we're listening to music, it's not that we're given juice immediately afterwards. Um, so there's something much more intrinsic about musical sounds as an as, as a reward. So now the question 
that, that I'm trying to answer is, you know, to what extent is music an intrinsic reward? To what extent is it an extrinsic reward? Right? And maybe more generally, how does music acquire its reward value? Um, so this model is perhaps not so controversial within the field, um, but the idea that musical features such as harmony and melody and rhythm and repetition um, cue to um, the predictions that the brain forms um, for the reward system. And so, uh, and that's um, how music becomes rewarding. So by predictions, I generally mean the kinds of knowledge that um, you can assess in advance of the stimulus being presented itself, right? So that includes musical expectation, includes anticipation for stimuli, uh, and for uh, by reward, I, re I generally mean preference and liking and emotion. So it's really a, qu a question about uh, how musical features acquire a preference. How does music become liked um, via the knowledge that we gain um, by learning from musical features? And so uh, on the reward side, uh, we have many influential work um, from, um, from Leonard Meyer, um, for example, who, um, who posited that slight violations in expectations cause emotion and meaning in music. Um, and then we have Berline who posited that there's an inverse U-shaped relationship between arousal and preference. So these are really classic works. Uh, and of course, there's many new, uh, a lot of new work coming out right now. Um, on the side of the predictions, um, I, uh, there's uh, David Huron's influential um, book, Sweet Anticipation, uh, which talked about different kinds of expectations, right? You, so you can have theoretical expectations, which are uh, kind of one shot knowledge that you have about specific pieces of music. So for, for example, a specific coronavirus song, right? So that, that uh, you can have very theoretical um, um, knowledge of that. On the other hand, you can you also have schematic knowledge of the way music tends to unfold. Right? So, for example, in Western uh, musical um, stimuli, um, uh, the five chord tends to be followed by one chord. Right? So, those kinds of ex uh, uh, expectations that are much more ingrained and, and generally part of the script of how music tends to unfold within your culture. Uh, then there's also in, in between there's the dynamically adaptive expectations, which get you from one system to the other. Um, so, so the questions that I'm trying to answer today are about how musical cues gain their reward values by uh, appealing to these different kinds of expectations. Um, and so the, the story is really um, all about um, the predictions that are statistically learned over time. Uh, and I really want to spend some time on short-term acquisition of these predictions. And so what exactly are being learned, um, who is learning these uh, predictions, um, and why do we learn these predictions? So those are the questions that I want to look at. Uh, and I'll show you some all, all new results from behavioral studies in my lab, also uh, results from neuroimaging, mainly functional MRI studies. Um, and there's a story about individual differences um, in sensitivity to music reward that is coming out as well. So one of the most predictable features um, that we have in many musical cultures um, is musical scale, right? And in, uh, in the Western musical scale, um, we have, of course, a um, two to one frequency ratio. So the octave um, is built around the two to one frequency ratio. This is the octave equivalence is also true of music of many different cultures. Um, and within the Western chromatic, equal tempered chromatic scale, um, you divide that two to one frequency ratio into 12 logarithmic steps. Okay, so I'm just gonna play this. You can hear this okay? Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Okay, thanks. All right, so, so that's the Western equal tempered chromatic scale, um, not so surprising. Um, now we wanted to come up with a new musical scale. This is um, a work that's from a while back now, um, but, but that really does not follow that um, two to one frequency ratio. So we use the Bolin Pierce scale. Um, so Bolin and Pierce independently uh, came up with the idea that, well, maybe it doesn't have to be two. Maybe you could actually have the scale that recurs in, in a, a three um, to one ratio frequency ratio. Um, and within that three, three to one frequency ratio, you can have 13 logarithmically even divisions of that scale. So this is what the Bull and Pierce scale sounds like. Right, so that's the new chromatic scale. And so you might ask, 
why 13 divisions of three? Um, well, it turns out that if you choose certain um, pitches along the, um, the 13 divisions, uh, they approximate low integer ratios when you play them together. Uh, and those low integer ratios then sound psychoacoustically smooth and consonant. And so they can, can become um, the chord uh, from which you can start to build a chord progression. So, um, so these are then chord progressions that we could choose. You know, each of these uh, numbers falls in, uh, can be plugged into N in that, um, in that formula um, to come up with a chord progression. So this is what a chord progression sounds like. Right, so that's some um, work that I've done a while back. Um, but what's new is that we wanted to test directly um, to what extent the, these predictions that you can form with this new scale um, can lead to reward from repeated exposure. Um, so we had Yuan Zhang, who is a, a, a clarinetist and a saxophonist and a, a flute player and the composer and electronic musician in the lab. Um, and he composed these naturalistic Bolin Pierce melodies. So the instruction that I gave him was take these core progressions and you use that however you will, right? So um, I wanted it to be a, a human composed um, set of musical melodies. Um, and I, I think this sounds pretty good. Um, some participants who heard it said, it sounds like Herbie Hancock. And I, I think that's, a, that's pretty good. Um, now we uh, had um, online listeners listen to a large set of melodies like this one, but more than one melody, of course. Um, and, and, and during that exposure phase, uh, they had to detect an infrequent vibrato in this uh, in this melody. And so whenever you hear the vibrato, uh, you have to um, press the V on your keyboard. So that was the exposure task. Okay. Um, so you could hear that there was one note with the vibrato in it. Um, and we also crucially manipulated how many um, presentations, how many times individual melodies were presented. So some melodies were heard zero times, so not at all. Uh, and then other melodies were heard two times, four times, six times, eight times, and so on, all the way up to 16 times. And so we, we did this over a few different experiments, um, but they were always pseudo randomized to uh, avoid immediate repetitions. Um, and so there were no back-to-back -back, um, repetitions of the same melody. Uh, and then crucially, we also manipulated um, the, uh, these, these melodies at a test. And so um, there were, um, this is a, a way to manipulate both the schematic and the vertical expectations for the stimuli. And so um, we, uh, uh, during the, the post exposure test phase, um, people also heard um, some melodies that were a little bit different towards the end. So this is the example. <laughs> So you could hear how the ending of that melody was different from the one before. So this is a, a, a results in an error in prediction. And so um, people had to listen to um, these melodies and uh, we pr uh, collected pre and post exposure melodies of uh, ratings of liking on the scale of one to seven. Seven means you love it. One means you don't like it at all. Um, so let's look at the pre exposure ratings. The first thing we saw was that there was a significant effect of novelty in that the first melodies, whichever, and we ran, randomized these melodies. So whichever melody was pseudo randomized to start first always got rated as, um, as the best. And so over time, people um, um, moved towards a happy medium of ratings, but usually the first few melodies tended to be rated um, quite highly. So, so there was an effect of novelty. Um, Interestingly, now this is the most important part of, uh, of this result is the post exposure rating. So after having listened to uh, a set of these melodies, um, first of all, how, um, how does the number of presentations affect your liking rating? Uh, 
And how does the manipulation of those endings of melodies um, affect your liking rating? And here is what we saw. Um, we saw, first of all, that there was a significant effect of repetitions in that uh, the melodies that were repeated more often or, or uh, were, were presented more times were rated as better. And so the prediction across melodies, um, this is a, a similar to a mere exposure effect um, that was had been re reported before. Uh, we also saw that there was an effect of manipulations in that um, there was a, a significant difference between original and manipulated melodies in that uh, within one melody, uh, we're forming predictions such that when the melody ended a different way, that, that resulted in a prediction error that uh, reduced the liking rating. And this was more um, observed as the number of repetitions um, was higher. So the more predictions you had, the larger the prediction error was. And so now we're extending our test um, to try to see, you know, to what extent does, uh, uh, does this increase in, um, in number of presentations leading to an improvement in liking ratings? Um, does that top out over, over the course of time, right? And so we're, we're now um, fitting different uh, models to the data and also testing more numbers of, of presentations um, to see uh, at what point our predictions start to, um, to change, change in their relationship to the liking. So do we actually see an inverse U-curve or, um, or is it a mere exposure effect that keeps persisting over time? Um, so that's one set of melodies. Um, I also wanted to come up with even more melodies. And so this is going back to uh, a previous um, a way that I'd used to compose these melodies from harmonies uh, by applying a finite state grammar. So recall the, the chord for chord, four chord chord progression that I'd shown you before. Um, we then had uh, uh, used each of those possible chords as a, a starting point um, and, uh, and composed, um, well, automatically generated melodies um, that led from one uh, from the first chord all the way to the last chord. So um, this is one example of a resulting melody. Right. And so with these very simple melodies, um, you can start to ask more specific questions about what you actually learn from this polling peer scale. Can you learn to expect uh, more statistically frequent tones. Um, so we use the, the Bolin Pierce uh, scale probe tone ratings test. So this is borrowing from Carol Kromhansel's seminal work uh, on the probe tone paradigm, where you heard a melody followed by a tone, and you had to rate how well that last tone fit the preceding melodies. And, and Kromhansel and many others had shown that um, the profile of ratings that you get from these probe tones reflects the frequencies of uh, of compositions, right? So if you heard something in C major, then your probe tone profile uh, ref looks like C major. And so we're, we're asking whether you can see the same for Bolin Peer scales as well. And so um, this is old data now. Um, uh, so the, the red line shows you what you're about to hear. And so the exposure profile of what you're about to hear. So uh, tone zero occurs 1000 times and so on. Um, and before you heard that um, set of, uh, uh, of of uh, exposure melodies, um, you uh, you make a certain rating, um, but that correlation between the ratings and the exposure uh, improves over time. And so if you just plot the correlation between the exposure profile and your ratings, um, you get an improvement in correlation. And this, I think, is a really strong test of statistical learning, a, a strong test of, uh, of sensitivity to the statistical structure of the scale from being exposed to it. So you now might also ask, well, if you really didn't know anything about the musical scale, um, then you really shouldn't show a statistically significant pre-exposure ratings. Um, so what's with that? Uh, and so the answer is that um, the answer has to do with um, the, the way the trial was presented. Uh, so if you um, listen to how the trial was um, uh, sounds, you first had to hear a melody and then you had to hear a tone and you're supposed to rate how well that tone fits the melody. Right, so that last tone um, had to um, be followed by, uh, sorry, had to uh, be pre preceded by uh, a set of melodies, uh, a, a specific melody. So you could parcel out the effect of the melody from the exposure set. And when you do that, um, the partial correlation um, pre-exposure drops to zero, suggesting that you really don't know anything about that musical system before you come into the experiment. So that's um, all uh, review. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is 
um, how does something like timbre, right? So uh, all the melodies that I've shown you so far uh, in this experiment had been pure tones, uh, but of course, uh, real sounds have more than one uh, frequency per sound. So I'll just play you a couple of different sounds. So that's one sound. That's another sound. So of course the timbre between those two sounds is different. Um, the first of those is the Western flute and the second of those is the pan flute. So even though they're playing the same pitch, um, you can hear that they're physically two different objects, right? Uh, and so if you look at the spectrogram of those two tones that I just played you, um, you can already see that um, the pan flute has much more widely spaced harmonics. And so here I'm showing you just a thin slice of that sound. Um, and you can see that both the flute and the pan flute here now, I'm showing you the spectrum of, uh, of, of those two tones. Uh, the flute and the pan flute playing the same fundamental frequency, um, but the pan flute tends to have more energy at the three to five to seven ratios, whereas the Western flute has more energy at every uh, integer ratio. And so, uh, and it's interesting when you uh, look into the, small but um, very passionate um, set of composers who are writing music for the bull and pier scale uh, you're much more likely to find music written in the pan flute and also written in clarinet and these are um, instruments that have a closed tube on, on one end and that um, enables uh, that results in um, uh, timbres that have more odd harmonics and so if you so the question is why right why is it that um, the bowl and pier scale seems to be composed more in odd harmonic instruments than not, um, but than, than um, other instruments. And so um, in the context of our, our prediction and prediction error and reward model, um, we wanted to ask how does acoustic content affect predictions? Right? So in particular, is there something about the spectral distribution of musical pitch that affects your prediction of musical structure? So it sounds not so surprising right, from a compositional perspective, um, but from a psychological perspective, it's actually quite, um, I think it's quite uh, important to think about how something that's like spectral distribution, which is a fairly low level acoustic attribute of sounds, uh, might actually make a connection to musical structure, which is a fairly high level representation of, um, you know, of music. So, so most theories about prediction and reward don't really go into that. Right? And so um, one, um, one idea is that pitches that have harmonics that are spaced apart in three to one ratios, because three to one ratios are the game of the bowl and pier scale, uh, might help you learn the bowl and pier scale. So for, for example, compared to pitches with harmonics that are spaced apart in two to one frequency ratios. Um, so I think I'll just skip ahead, um, but I'll just show you uh, one experiment that we did that uses complex tones as timbres. Um, I'll just talk about this one. Um, so um, here we have uh, two artificially generated sets of melodies with different timbres. Um, in one case, we have the fundamental frequency with odd harmonics. So this is the trial where, again, you hear a melody followed by a tone and you have to rate how well that last tone fits the melody. Okay, and then here's another example where you have, again, the fundamental frequency with even harmonics instead of odd harmonics. Right, so they sound on the surface a little bit different, um, but not that different. And there's not particularly one that sounds worse than the other. Um, now we, again, made these um, pre and post exposure ratings um, at, before and after participants listen to the melodies either in the odd harmonics or the even harmonics for half an hour. Um, and after that, we made we, we plotted the correlations between um, the pre exposure and, uh, and the exposure and the post exposure and the exposure. And we found that the odd harmonics were indeed um, resulting in, indeed resulted in higher correlations and also higher partial correlations. Um, after exposure, which suggests that um, the timbre does in fact um, act as a cue to help you learn um, the, um, the Bowen-Pierce scale better. So there's something about this 
uh, spectral distribution of sounds that affect the predictions of musical structure. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, it, it sounds like it's it's a kind of kind of compositional quirk, right? something about weird timbres that um, give you a cue towards weird musical scales. Um, but if you translate that to what Western music might have been like, right? So maybe there's something about Western musical timbres that give you a cue towards Western musical structure. And if you extend that towards um, other kinds of sounds that we learn from statistically, like speech sounds, right? Maybe there's something about voices that we're ex or, or sounds that we're exposed to in our world that gives you a, a cue towards um, the language systems that you learn in a fairly high level way. So, um, so I think that's one way in which um, predictions that we haven't really thought about much before might actually inform our, um, our top-down knowledge of a musical system, which then informs your um, the, re um, the reward that you get from listening to music. Um, so I think that the probe tone ratings really do quite a good job of revealing our predictions and our knowledge about musical scale. Um, and timbre, which is uh, specifically uh, manipulated here as spectral distribution of acoustic energy, um, can inform our predictions and aid the learning of scale structure. Um, and in a way that's maybe kind of predicted from, um, from composition, but not predicted from conventional um, theories of statistical learning and, and prediction error. And so um, and, and so far, we've been pretty effective, I think, at, uh, at operationalizing reward with liking ratings. And so uh, another uh, from, from the earlier studies that I showed you, um, it was pretty clear that repeated exposure generates predictions. Uh, which then change reward um, as operationalized by liking ratings. Um, and, and the manipulations that we made um, generate prediction error, which then engender violations in expectations. And so, all right, so I, I wanted to turn to the next question of predictions by whom, right? So um, are, is there something about um, individual people that show differences in how predictions can engender reward? And I wanted to turn to the case, curious case of musical anhedonia. And so this is some work that I've done a couple of years back now. Um, we came across one particular gentleman called, we'll call him BW, um, who reported a socially debilitating um, lack of emotional responses to music. So uh, we, uh, we use the Barcelona Music Reward Questionnaire, a BMRQ, uh, which is a set of questions that assess uh, how um, sensitive you are to the rewards of music listening uh, along five different subscales, music seeking, emotion evocation, mood regulation, sensory motor, and social reward. Right? So for example, a question like, oh, music makes me want to dance, would be one that um, is in the sensory motor subscale of the BMRQ. Um, we also wanted to, um, to make sure if we're identifying people with musical anhedonia, that we're not identifying people with general anhedonia. So we uh, controlled for general anhedonia using the physical anhedonia scale. So we'd ask things like, how much do you like long walks on the beach? Or, or agree or disagree, uh, I hate long walks on the beach. And so most people who are not anhedonic would disagree. Um, and we uh, ask about auditory items as well as non-auditory items um, in that survey. So. Uh, so BW, this is re reviewing old data now, um, he showed he was five standard deviations below the mean on all the subscales of the BMRQ. Right? So he was indeed very um, musically anhedonic. And this was also quite specific to, um, to auditory types of hedon uh, hedonic responses. So he did not show any um, anhedonia with non non-sound items. So he was just as likely to enjoy good food, just as likely to enjoy long walks on the beach, just didn't like musical sounds. And so how did, so we, we started to recruit a large group of, um, of adults who, um, who, list, uh, who did the uh, Bolin Peer scale music listening. And then we separated those um, listeners by um, their BMRQ score. And so um, consistent with previous literature, we separated the subjects into uh, tertiles um, by their BMRQ, whether they were uh, by, by whether they were anhedonic, which is low BMRQ, or hedonic or hyperhedonic, which is middle or high um, tertiles. Um, and first of all, we saw that the anhedonics were much uh, more, less likely to rate um, um, to, to enjoy the pieces of music, which is not surprising. Um, but what was really exciting is that there was a 
quadratic relationship um, that fits the anhedonics more. So in, in that, after having heard those Bolin Pierce melodies for, uh, for half an hour, um, they were more quick the um, topping out at what um, at, at their ratings, so they it took fewer presentations for them um, to reach their peak of um, of uh, enjoyment. So that was very exciting, and and for um, for BW specifically, we'd also um, looked at his um, brain connectivity using um, diffusion tensor imaging um, between auditory areas and uh, reward sensitive areas, including the nucleus accumbens and medial prefrontal cortex. And we saw that BW indeed had um, lower volume of connectivity between the um, auditory areas and the, uh, and the nucleus accumbens. And so looking at this data along with, um, with other data that was coming out um, from a few other groups, um, Amy Belfi and I came up with this neuroanatomical uh, model of music and reward, uh, where we posited that the auditory system is important for forming predictions, and it makes connections with the reward system um, that generates the reward, right? So, and there are specific regions that we can look at in the auditory areas, such as the superior temporal gyrus, and also in the reward areas, such as the medial prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens, and specific um, disconnections or or disruptions in any of these regions could result in um, musical anhedonia. So then you know, Diana Wang, who was in my lab, took this anatomical model and put it into actual brain space um, and, and then used that to define functional connectivity uh, between the auditory and reward regions um, uh, in a large openly available um, database of uh, resting state functional MRI data um, comparing people with Alzheimer's disease um, at different stages. And what we saw was that the more severe your Alzheimer's disease was, the less overall connectivity you had between auditory and reward system. Um, but even folks with the most severe forms of, of Alzheimer's disease um, had some um, remaining connectivity between auditory and reward system. So this is something that will be useful in the future um, for um, working with, uh, with music therapists and coming up with some um, specific therapies that might be useful for um, for using music to help those with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this is something that's for a different talk, um, but what I wanted to uh, turn to is um, a functional MRI task that uses music listening specifically to look into the auditory and reward system and the connectivity between the auditory and reward system. Um, so we had uh, people listen to, to music that they brought in that was self-selected. And also we had music, uh, people listen to music that we selected for them that were either well-known pieces of music, you know, like Adele or something on the billboard list or, or some Beethoven, right? Uh, and then we had people uh, listen, uh, make familiarity ratings and liking ratings in the scanner. Uh, and we tested a, a, a group of young adults and then also um, folks, uh, folks who are older adults. So just let's just look at, um, first of all, the uh, main effects of self-selected music listening. Um, so we found that, maybe not surprisingly, people who scored low on BMRQ, right, who were possibly musically anhedonic, um, tended to show activity in the auditory system, but not in the reward system. And then for people who, who were age match controls who scored kind of normal or high on, uh, on the BMRQ had, um, had activity in the auditory and the reward system. Um, so that's pretty exciting, but that does replicate some other results from the Satori lab that had um, shown these neural correlates of musical anhedonia. Um, we then turned to just young adults um, who were listening to self-selected music. And what we found, uh, first of all, was that self-selected music was much better at engaging the brain, especially at engaging the reward system um, compared to other selected music. So just the self versus other contrast resulted in large scale activity in the auditory and the reward system. Um, now, the older adults um, also showed similar activity, but less, much less of that same activity. And when you contrast the young and older adults, we saw that the young adults uh, had higher activity in both the auditory and the reward system. So this is actually not um, super surprising, considering that um, Amy Belfi and her group had actually um, tested a large sample um, across different ages in the Barcelona Music Reward Questionnaire and, and found that overall older adults tend to show less uh, or report less music reward sensitivity. Um, but what we then wanted to do, we wanted to ask was, you know, how does mindful, consistent music listening 
um, change that uh, that pattern of of activity between the auditory and the reward system. So we worked with Suzanne Hanser, who is a music therapist in uh, at Berkeley School of Music, which is just down the street from us. Uh, we worked with Maya Geddes, who is a neurologist um, who at the Harvard Medical School, who is just down the street the other way from us. Um, and we worked. We defined an eight-week intervention of daily music listening, where these older adults. Um, listened to music that was chosen uh, in co consultation with a music therapist who called them on the phone and checked them in with them every week uh, and wrote down and journaled their reflections in the logbook. And before and after we did pre and post inter um, intervention, functional MRI and neuropsychological testing. And so when listening to music that you love, that you rate as being highly liked, um, first of all, I already showed you that the young adults um, had more activity in the reward system. The older adults had some activity, but less. Um, and this activity, specifically the medial prefrontal cortex, after intervention was increased or resuscitated um, in the medial prefrontal cortex in older adults in a way that made the activity of the medial prefrontal cortex more like that of young adults. So that was really exciting. Specifically, we then wanted to look into uh, the functional connectivity between the auditory and the reward system. This is work by Alex Belden uh, in my lab. And what he did was he took the anatomically defined auditory network that I'd shown you earlier and asked where in the brain does that connect? Uh, do we see a change in connectivity um, before and after intervention? And the only region where we saw a post-intervention increase compared to pre-intervention um, scans um, was in the medial prefrontal cortex. And so specifically, when you look at the time series of that functional connectivity before, between the auditory and the reward um, areas, we found that that uh, was more sensitive in, uh, for self-selected music compared to other selected music. So we find that this auditory engagement of the reward system changes throughout the lifespan, and it seems to be enhanced by mindful music listening. And so, um, of course, like we really believe that there's something about music listening and mindfulness that changes the brain, um, then, and that, that there's something about mindful listening that changes throughout the lifespan, then the developmental time period or, or the part point in the lifespan when you first hear a particular piece of music should matter, right? And so this is work that's um, Nick Cathios in, uh, in my lab had done before, um, where he showed this idea of the reminiscence, reminiscence bump, which is when you're, you know, in your 40s or 50s or 60s, you think back in your life about the music that was most meaningful to you uh, or most, um, most likely to generate autobiographical memories um, it turns out that you're mo most likely to report music from your adolescence or young adulthood. And so um, you can define this using song specific age, right? So you take a age of the song uh, when it first arrived on the billboard charts, um, or uh, for music that was composed before there were billboard charts like Mozart, right? You could add, just ask how old were you when you first heard this particular piece of music? Um, and so what Nick did was he separated um, the, the activity, um, brain activity from our previous study um, during music listening um, by the age of first exposure. And what we found was that this is very preliminary data, so uh, we have more to do. Um, but what we found is that music that was first heard during young adulthood, right, so in your late teens and early 20s, was more likely to um, activate the auditory and the reward systems. So I think that's really exciting. Um, and it really does point to a much more nuanced view of why music engages and why and how music engages the reward system throughout your lifespan. Uh, now, I'd previously said that um, music reward sensitivity decreases as you, you age, but it turns out that I kind of lied because if you look into um, the BMRQ um, by subscales, most of the decrease, the age related decrease in music reward sensitivity was driven by the music seeking subscale. So older adults are less likely to seek out new music, but they're actually, if anything, more likely to seek out music as a way to regulate their own mood and as a, a rate, way to, um, to look for social reward, right? to, to become close to others, um, which I think is part of 
um, of why during the pandemic, the co novel coronavirus pandemic, as you heard um, in the previous talk by Niels, um, um, you know, people um, so rapidly shifted towards music listening because it was a way to seek out uh, social experiences when social experiences in person were not available. And so as part of our kind of uh, addition to the large body of work that Niels presented in the previous talk, um, I worked with Roni Grano and others um, where we administered a survey uh, across uh, 5,000 um, people in 11 countries in six different languages. And we asked this simple question, how does certain activities help you achieve a certain well-being goal? And the activities include music, but also information seeking, like looking at the news or looking at movies and or eating food or cooking or working or reading and so on. Um, and the well-being goals included um, achieving social bonding, increasing positive emotions, reducing negative emotions, um, achieving diversion and connecting with yourself. Um, and across many different, all these different results, you know, lots of findings that are reported in the paper um, shown here, what we saw was that rated, music was rated as the most effective, more effective than any other activity in achieving well-being goals. Um, furthermore, we saw that um, this reported effectiveness of music improves with age. So those who are above 65 were actually more likely to report using music uh, and that that music was a most effective goal for well-being. And so it's not necessarily the case that as you old, uh, as you age, the, um, the mu music doesn't engage your reward system anymore. Um, rather, you, you turn to different ways of engaging with music um, as we age. So just to sum up a little bit on the insights from um, the neurobiological studies, um, we think that musical anhedonia has to do with the individual differences in how predictions and gender reward. Um, and um, a lot of what I presented shows that reward for music changes throughout the lifespan. There are age-related changes in reward sensitivity, um, but that the age of song exposure, like when you first heard the music, does also af uh, affect that reward sensitivity. And also what we're seeing, we're starting to see is that consistent and mindful music listening can actually change that reward sensitivity um, in, in aging in older adults. Um, and also the use of music for well-being goals increases with age. And so a more general um, methodological note is that uh, when you're interested in engaging the reward system with music, uh, maybe you should just ask people what music they like to listen to and, and have them bring them in um, because self-selected music is uh, most effective at engaging the reward system. So, um, so I, and I think this is useful for increasing the ecological validity and, and kind of naturalistic um, aspect of how we design our neuroimaging studies. Um, so all of this has been a lot of fun, um, all very new, new work. Um, and it wouldn't be possible without massive collaborations that include uh, people from outside my field. Um, so this kind of consistent dialogue like we're having today um, and in this wonderful conference, um, this consistent dialogue between the sciences and the humanistic um, in, uh, modes of inquiry into the music studies is something that um, I've um, started to, to look into with um, co-editors, um, Lisa Margulis and Deidre Lockridge. Uh, and we have a volume coming out entitled uh, Science Music Borderlands, uh, which really engages in the dialogue across the humanistic and the scientific approaches to music. Many of the wonderful speakers that uh, you've heard from today, we'll hear from tomorrow, um, are contributors to this volume. Um, and it's in production by MIT Press right now. Hopefully you'll see this um, later this year online and, and then eventually in print. And hopefully you will see that by the time uh, we can all meet in person again. And so one way to do that in the future is the Society of Music Perception and Cognition, which is uh, for now planned for um, um, August this year in Portland, Oregon. And, and, um, and this is of course, barring any new um, pandemic variants, um, but you can check out musicperception.org for uh, the details about when to submit. Uh, we're accepting submissions uh, on, through abstracts through mid-February. And so with that, I will thank you all for your attention and I'll thank all the wonderful um, lab members and also the funding sources that make this work possible. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, Psyche.
thank you very much for for these insights let me check whether anything happened in the chat give people a little moment to reply Oh, it's funny. I thought, and according to my um, my clock on the PowerPoint, I thought I was way, way, way over time, but it turns out I was yeah. like just fantastic. Not super time. Spot on. <laughs> it's really great. I see clapping, and uh, oh, great! Yes, the clapping. I have blocked out of the coming. YouTube uh, to avoid feedback, so now you're you're my only feedback. Yes. So we have a little delay between the YouTube and the and the Zoom. So hmm. I see plenty of hands clapping, Psyche. It's really impressive work. So maybe while giving people time, I, um, I, I have a question. Uh, I, I, I was uh, about to say that you were always ahead of time with your work on, on statistical learning in music. I mean, I think that's the first work I, I've known you, from you. That a lot <laughs> coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and there is always the, the, the question when it comes to the Boland Pierce scale and people learning the Boland Pierce scale that these people have a representation of the chromatic scale already. And how, how, is the, how much do people use their chromatic knowledge to learn the, the, the Boland Pierce scale or is there in, interference or, or, yeah. Right, so yeah. if you expect that um, people are bringing their knowledge of the Western chromatic scale into their interpretation of the Bolin Pierce scale, um, then pitches that more closely approximate specific pitches in the Western scale should be rated as higher. But mm -hmm. that was not what we see, right? So the, the, I think it was pitch eight was the same as like the uh, what a scale degree four and a half in, in the Western scale. And, and we checked for that and that, that was not what we see. So it does seem like people are forming novel categories from exposure to um, the task and then to the, the corpus of full and Pierce melodies that we threw at them during exposure. Have you tried- I mean, also we would expect that um, people with more musical training might uh, be better at, uh, at the task. And that was not, we, we didn't see an interaction mm -hmm. with musical mm -hmm. training. Has this been tried with people from other musical systems, other musical cultures? That's what I would love to do. Have not yet tried it. But yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay, there is a question from Roni in the chat, and I paste it in the in the Zoom chat chat so that you can read it. But I'll read it out loud uh, as well. It also concerns the Boland Pierce. Uh, uh, scale, but the timbre effect, could it be driven by dissonance, the three to one being less dissonant and hence eliciting higher appropriateness ratings? The three to one is not um, less dissonant than the two to one, right? So a two to one frequency ratio being an octave, three to one frequency ratio being a 12, um, they're similarly consonant. Um, and and I, I didn't get a chance to present. There's another experiment in that suite where we also looked at um, uh, shepherd tones that were spaced apart even further. And so in the experiment that I did manage to show you, the, the timbres were, the overtones were spaced apart, either odd or even. Uh, but in another experiment, we did them th actual three to one frequency ratios or two to one frequency ratios. And, um, and we also saw that three to one led to better learning, yeah. So I think it's really about the consistency, the congruency between the timbre and the scale. I mean, and that's maybe why when you, when you hear, um, let's say a carillon or a bell, which is in harmonic, right? If you hear that play like Bach, it sounds a bit odd. Um, but if you hear like an organ or or a flute play the Bach, then it sounds more consistent. I mean, there are many other reasons for that. That's much more kind of culturally confounded. And, and I think that the Bowen Pierce scale offers a much less confounded way to get at that question. Okay. We have another uh, question um, into similar directions concerning the Bowen Pierce um, scale. Were all the Bowen uh, Pierce pieces consistent in terms of complexity or their cultural distance from Western music? 
If not, do you think this would influence the perceived ratings? That's a question. That's a great me. question. Um, yeah. I think that um, what I haven't checked, uh, you know, so given the uh, human composed Poland Pierce melodies, um, what I, I, there might be some that are more complex than others. There might be some that are um, have more of a cultural distance from Western music than others. I, I haven't been able to check that yet. But what I can tell you is that all the uh, effects that I'm showing you are um, are randomized um, and are not driven by specific item effects. So when I say that the whatever melody people first heard first was rated as best, like this effect of novelty, um, different people heard different tunes first, right? So it wasn't influenced by items. And then when also when I say that melodies that were repeated 16 times or that I've been heard 16 times were rated as higher, um, those were 16 different melodies across uh, for, for each person. Okay. There is, there was a question at the very, very beginning of your talk um, that came from the Social Bridges team directly, and I, I think it's Merle behind. And, and she had an interesting uh, question on the dopamine system and um, yeah, stroking like rhythms. So they are looking in their lab at overlap between effective touch, stroking behavior and lullabies and how this may prime reward to stroking like rhythms. And then she asks whether we may need to think about reward mechanisms for ry rhythm and reward for melodies and where this dopaminergic prediction circuitry is more relevant. Right, so uh, there, yeah, so the, the stroking stuff is quite curious, right? I had heard some studies that heard of some studies where uh, you can stroke the back of your arm either uh, slowly and nicely, <laughs> like three, sure, yeah. what, three centimeters per second or like 30 centimeters per second. And everyone's like, that's really weird. And that's not weird. Right? And then this activates your reward system. And that one doesn't. Um, fibers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess the, the question is more generally about like biological rhythms, right? Are there something, is there something about the rhythm, rhythmicity of, um, of melodies that uh, where melodies presented at certain rates might be best or better at engaging the reward system. And I think that's, uh, that might be the case, right? There's a reason why there are op optimal tempos for pieces of music, right? Um, and I, I don't know what exactly the biological mechanisms are um, or whether they have more to do with brain rhythms than with particular like walking rhythms or stroking rhythms. Um, so, but I, I do believe that they are constrained, you know, these rhythms of music are constrained by biological properties of uh, rhythmic or reson uh, resonant structures that might have certain optimal preferred frequencies. So, so the work of at large, for example, um, you know, has been looking at that for, for many, uh, many years. And, you know, we are collaborating with them to find, find particular um, pieces of music at particular types of stimulation, such as light stimulation, that could be paired with music that might be specifically useful for stimulating different kinds of biological or or uh, brain rhythms. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there are some um, ways to think about music that might be inspired by these biological or neural rhythms. Um, and I think that's, I mean, we're having this like really cool discussion in the way that maybe most composers don't think about it that way, right? Most people, most composers don't think of music as like a way to cater towards biological rhythms. Um, but if we can unlock that and kind of get into that, then um, we might be able to compose music that's um, not only uh, rewarding, um, but also biologically beneficial in ways that might solve some of the world's crises that Niels talked about in the last talk. And, and talking uh, about Niels, he is super active right now in the chat. Oh. So oh. He, has, he has opened a little thread that I will paste to you. So first thing he says, a nitty gritty music COVID related question. You found that well-being benefit from engaging with music during lockdown increase with age. So that's the first thing. So now the second, wait. 
At the same time, others have found that young people increase their creative arts engagement during lockdown more than older people did. And now comes the question, how do we explain the combination of these two findings? Is it a dosage thing? I did the older population not need to increase their music consumption as much because it was already more effective. I think that's the end of the thread. Yeah, that's a great um, question, right? I mean, I think that the reason why they, we see young younger people um, seeking out more the creative arts engagement during the lockdown might have be the same finding, the same uh, same reason why we see that younger people score higher on music seeking in the Barcelona Music Reward questionnaire. Right? So I think young people seek out um, new experiences more, but older people might be um, more able to use whatever musical or artistic information that they have um, to regulate their moods and to um, and to bring themselves closer to others. Yeah. So I think it's about seeking versus um, regulation. Do older adults seek out other things, not necessarily music? Have you, you had this in your in your activities. Right. right, so um, yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure that we looked at that. Maybe I should ask Roni <laughs> and, um, and uh, to see if um, you know, information seeking or, or cooking or okay. physical activity also um, are increasing with, um, with age. So I don't remember seeing that, um, that analysis. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me check the, the chat. It looks still a lot of clapping. And our next speaker is uh, arriving as well. I think we will close the session at that point. Psyche, it was a pleasure to have you here and to to hear about your, your new work uh, in, in all these fascinating directions. We thank you very much for being here and we hope that you will be around tomorrow as well for, for further discussions. And I should say yeah, one point for uh, the early career researchers who are joining us, mm -hmm. some of that work from uh, the, about the Bolin Pier scale, in particular the timbre stuff, I started that 14 years, 15 years ago now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there are some projects that are sort of near and dear to your heart that you kind of don't do for a while and then eventually get back to it. So, yeah. So if there are any projects that kind of are like that for you, um, don't worry, you can eventually get back to it. That's a fantastic final <laughs> word, Psyche. Thank you very much and have a, a great you guys. day. See you. I look forward to engaging more in the next couple of days. Absolutely. Thanks.